Okay, so if you're just joining the recording, this is pre-workshop number two, an introduction to Python as well as to Jupyter. And myself, as well as two of the other Python instructors, Daniel Quay and Oladipo Mumin, will be taking you through some of the training today. So I will begin by just giving a background um, kind of a brief overview of scientific computing in Python and Jupyter and why we are teaching you this at all. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Um, if you ask in the chat, there are a couple of us online and we can answer them uh, via the chat. Um, you may also raise your hand and ask questions that way. Okay. So um, hopefully you can all see my screen. So as I mentioned, I'll give a brief overview of scientific computing with Python and Jupyter. So the first question is, why should we ocean scientists learn to code? And by ocean scientists, I mean, I'm including kind of anyone, anyone in the near ocean sciences. So, um, there are many reasons my, want, want, my why we might want to learn to code. And one of them uh, is that we might want to do some difficult calculations and we might want to do it quickly, at least quicker than we could on a chalkboard like this. So um, this actually includes running things like ocean or climate models, which have a lot of uh, differential equations in them and computers can help us run those calculations quickly. Um, another uh, great thing that um, coding can help us with is handling data, especially large data sets where it might get very tedious uh, to handle um, with, with pen and paper. And lastly, with coding, we can create really beautiful visualizations. Um, this one is from NASA with um, some nice eddies in the agullas here. So what programming languages exist? There are a lot. Uh, I've named a few here. So Python is the main one we'll be using. Um, you'll be using a little bit of Julia as well mm. next week. Um, you may have heard of R, MATLAB, C or C++, HTML, JavaScript. Uh, the list goes on there. There are many languages. Um, in general, um, the Python, Julia and R are kind of multi-purpose relatively easy to use, which we call high level languages, which are really great for scientific computing. MATLAB is also mostly used for scientific computing, but we, it is what we call proprietary, which means it's not open source. And I'll get to that on the next slide, um, but it means you have to have a license to be able to run it. Uh, C and C++ are kind of more general purpose, considered a bit harder to use and harder to learn. And we call these kind of low level languages. And HTML and JavaScript are two examples for making websites. Um, so I mentioned open source. Uh, what is open source software? Uh, it is software that has a fully open, publicly av available source code that can be modified and shared. So what's really great about open source is it, because it can be modified by, by anyone and it can be shared with everyone, there's kind of no secrets. Um, it promotes collaboration as well as transparency. So everyone can see how the code is written and then you can add to it if you want to create your own functions or your own um, new features. And I think that in science, collaboration and transparency are really important. So I, I think that open source software is very important in the sciences. So some examples of open source software, um, Python, R, and Julia, all open. Um, some examples of proprietary software I mentioned before, like MATLAB, also things that we use like Microsoft Word, Adobe Photoshop. Um, these are not um, open source. Uh, we can't see their source code. Um, so a benefit of a lot of open source software, it's not necessar necessarily true, but it's almost always true, is that it's freely available, which is uh, really wonderful. Okay, 
I'm just going to remind everyone to mute yourselves if you're not talking. Uh, I can hear a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Um, so why are we using Python? So Python is a very general purpose language. It's versatile. It's used in a lot of different fields. Um, for instance, it's used for data analysis, for data science, machine learning, web development, and so on. And this here is just showing many of the companies that use Python. So they're doing all sorts of different, different things. Um, it's uh, considered very easy to read and easy to learn. So that's really a great introductory language. It's very popular. So this is really great because it means there's a large support community. So if you have questions, there are a lot of places you can go to ask those questions and a large community of people who can answer those questions. Um, and some of those places include Stack Overflow. It's a great place to go if you have oh, yes, coding yes. questions. Oh. Oh, a reminder, oh, please oh, yes. mute yourself oh, yes. if you are not asking a question. Thanks. <laughs> One of the other instructors could help mute. That would be great. It's hard while I'm sharing my screen. Thank you. Um, so Stack Overflow is great. Uh, GitHub, this is a website you might come across. If you Google some, some issues, you might come across GitHub and that sometimes there are some, some answers there. Um, and I'm gonna give a shout out to Pangeo, which is a community I'm very involved in. And that's supporting um, anyone in the geosciences. So that includes ocean, climate, um, and many other sciences. Um, and it's, it's all about Python and it's, the idea is to provide the supporting um, community to help people learn and, and progress uh, in their computing, scientific computing journey. So um, Python also scales well with large data sets. That's really helpful in the ocean and climate sciences where a lot of our, our data sets, whether that's satellite data or uh, model data, um, is really big. And so Python is able to scale well, especially in conjunction with a few other tools. And that's really useful. Um, and, and one last thing I'll mention is that Python seems to be in high demand for, for employment. So, um, you know, that's always good. Um, if you don't stay in that academic track, then, then it gives you kind of another option because it's a great skill to have. Okay, so that's kind of why we write in Python. How do we write Python code? Well, we need a Python interpreter. So when we write the Python code, it can be interpreted by the computer. Um, usually we don't have to think much about this. Um, if you're running locally, we usually just do this by downloading Anaconda, which is what we did yesterday. And Anaconda includes this interpreter as well as a lot of other things. Um, and I'll refer you to yesterday's um, workshop if you want to know more, which is uh, now posted on YouTube. Um, and you can run Python at the command line. So if in this, in this terminal, um, we can just write something like print hello world, it'll print hello world. So this is a line of Python that we just write at the terminal uh, command line. We can also write scripts. So this is a very um, simple script where I've written um, these four lines of Python, and then I can run that script and it'll run all of the lines together. Or we can use Jupyter to write Python code, which is what we are going to do at this school. So uh, Jupyter Notebooks are a platform that we, um, where we can write code and run code, but it also supports a lot of other fancy features, which are really handy, like inline text comments, figures, and equations. So that means you can have some code, you can run the code, you can get an output, you can make a comment um, and say the above output, you know, shows something. And um, you can have figures, so you can, you know, see if, like an image within, um, within your, your notebook. And you can even type out equations, so you can remember what equations you're trying to code. So it's really versatile, it's, it's quite useful. So a Jupyter notebook looks something like this. So in this example, this is a code block. It, uh, it uh, shows this figure. So by running this code, we end up getting this figure, which is a nice map. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see that there are actually two comments of just text. So that's not code. It's just kind of um, 
text, which in this case, um, this is part of the CartaPy tutorial, which we'll include for this school. Um, you'll just be able to um, write text so that you can kind of read what's going on. Um, Jupyter Notebooks run in your browser, uh, which is really nice. Uh, if you are running on your local computer, even though it runs in your browser, it does not require internet. So that's an interesting feature. Um, also, as I'm talking here about Jupyter, fun fact, Jupyter is actually kind of a um, short for Julia, Python, and R. So it was, you actually can run many other languages in Jupyter as well now, but it was originally started as a, as a platform to write Julia, Python, and R. So there are a lot more aspects to Jupyter. So there's this kind of whole Jupyter ecosystem. So the Jupyter Notebook is what I just mentioned. That's considered kind of the classic interface. There's Jupyter Lab, which is um, a snazzier version of Jupyter Notebook. So that would look something like what we have over here. So here we have notebook. This still looks like what we expect. We have some lines of code. We have an image. We have some text. Um, that's pretty much a regular notebook. But we also have all these features in the sidebar here. So here is, you can actually look at all of um, your file systems, see all the files here. There are also these options on the far left that are different extensions. Um, and Jupyter Hub is another aspect of the ecosystem, which is um, a centralized platform that we can use to deploy Jupyter Notebooks. And this can be done for many users. And this is what we'll be using at Coessing this year. So it's a um, it's very easy setup. No installation is needed, which means all you need to do is fill out the Google form that I sent out through an email. So hopefully you all got that. Um, then one of one of the instructors will add you to the hub, and you just log in and you get your your Jupyter all set up. And our our Jupyter hub this year will be running on Google Cloud. So you'll be doing some cloud computing this year. Okay, so hopefully uh, that was a nice little introduction. Um, before I hand it off, I wanted to do a quick introduction to our Jupyter Hub. Um, and I will do that here. So this is what, if you have the link to the hub, um, which you can get through the email that I sent. It's this very long, complicated um, link. So just click, click the link that we sent in the email. You should see something that looks like this. So you'll notice that it says for coessing. Apologies, our logo is only for in Ghana. So it still says in Ghana. Um, but anyway, it's, it's our coessing hub. Um, you can click log in to continue and it will take you to a page like this. Um, the only thing you need to do here is you can just click log on. So here it says select identity provider. If you click here, Google is the only option. So sometimes there can be other options to log in. In this case, you have to have a Google account. So just leave it as Google. You can click remember the selection um, if you don't wanna have to go through this again. And then you click log on. I'm just gonna use my email there and we'll see if that works. So you'd put in your email and your password. And this should be the same email that you signed up with the Google form that I sent out. And it can take quite a while for this to open. So it could take two or three minutes, um, maybe even a bit longer. So mine went really quickly because I actually just logged in right before. Um, but this is what it looks like when you log in. So this is, um, it should take you first to this launcher page um, and you can see all of the options here. Um, the main option, so here this for notebook, if you click Python 3, that will start a new notebook. Um, if you click Julia, um, this will start a new notebook that runs Julia instead of Python. So that's how you can start new notebooks. But mostly, uh, we won't be starting new notebooks. You're always welcome to. But mostly we'll be using what's over here on the left-hand side. So uh, we have 
um, here, it says Coesting 2022 Hub. If we click this folder here, we actually go back to our kind of home. Um, this is a shared folder where there may be some data. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll stay within this Coesting 2022 Hub. And uh, you can see that there are various uh, notebooks added here, and we'll be using these once I pass this on to, to my colleagues. Um, and you can just double click on anything, it'll open up a notebook. So this is what Daniel will walk you through in just a moment. Um, and uh, we'll start getting used to the notebook interface as well as um, being introduced to Python. So I think maybe I will just do a quick demonstration of using a notebook. So you'll see there's a plus up, up here. If you click that, it'll add these new cells as we call them. And so you're going to write your code kind of in, in these different cells. Um, and notice that there are these brackets. Maybe I can zoom in, if that's helpful. There are these empty brackets here. Um, if I type something, so I'm just defining a variable A to be eight, then I can run it either by pressing this play or by typing shift enter or shift return. And now you see that this says one. So that's because it was the first cell to be evaluated. If I do another cell, B equals seven, it's gonna say two. Uh, if I want to run, uh, you, you notice now it says code. I currently have this cell selected. I can go over here and type markdown and markdown basically means text. So now I can type text and it won't be evaluated. So notice here, it kind of got rid of the cell outline because this is just text. Um, so there are a lot of other kind of fancy, fancy things you can do with Markdown, um, but this was at least a very basic introduction to, to all of that. Okay, um, I see there might be a few questions in the chat. Are there other questions before we continue? Uh, okay, great. Thanks, Simone. But actually, that's not the correct, that's not the correct uh, address for the hub. We want to send the, the big one that's really messy that has all of the, uh, that will sync to the GitHub repository. So I will, um, I can send that link through the chat. It'll look really messy. Um, you can just click on it. And that's the one that you want to use. So I will do that now. Um, okay, thanks, Daniel. Daniel just sent that. So this is the link that you should use. Um, we will, um, we have it provided in the email. We will, um, I'll also have a link um, on Slack. Um, and for those of you who are attending virtually, um, I'm putting together a big PDF that will tell you all of the Zoom links and where to go. And we'll have one, a big, you know, click here to access the Jupyter Hub link. So you'll be able to access it there. Uh, okay, are there any other questions before I pass it on to Daniel? Okay. Well, as, as we go, feel free to type questions in the chat um, or chime in with any questions you have. And with that, I will pass it on to Daniel. Yeah, hello. Yes, good afternoon. Yeah, I should thank everybody. Oh, good morning to everything. Are you end? It's still morning. <laughs> yes. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, yeah, just a second. Hello, Daniel. Can I ask a question? Yes, I, I think you can. The, the, Once I set up, yeah. Okay. Please, you can go ahead. The I don't know. The, the something is not after opening the link. 
it says I got a response that um, have not been added or something. Like, looks like you have not been added to the list of allowed users for this hub. Did you get an error that says forbidden? Yes. Yeah. So I'm just typing this out now in the chat. If you get that, it probably means you didn't fill out the Google form to get access. So unfortunately, we have we had to have this extra step where you have to fill out a Google form. I'll I'll link to it in, in a minute in the chat and just fill that out with your name and email. And then one of the instructors will add you to the hub and you'll have access. I, I just did. Yeah, so the pro, so then we will do that now. The problem is we have to add you manually. So even if you just do it, you have to wait for one of us to go and look. So I can do that right now and I'll add anyone who just did it. Um, sorry for the delay. Okay. Hello, please. Thank you, Bridge. Please, can I ask a question? Hello? Yeah, hi, we can hear you. Yeah, can I ask a question, please? Uh, I feel the form also, the Google form online, uh, but uh, I've not received the mail and I made use of Yahoo mail. I don't know whether I have to get another Gmail for it to work, yes. what happened? Yeah, so I think you can only use a Gmail account. And once you fill the form, it takes us maybe a couple of hours to add you because those okay. of us responsible for the addition, we are the same people in the workshop. So Paige has volunteered to do that alongside. So if you could fill, refill the form with a Gmail account, okay. then that will be resolved. Yes, thank you. All right, I'll do that now. Okay, great. So I'm sharing my screen now. I hope um, it's visible. <laughs> Yeah, and Paige, can you confirm? I mean, the the size. I don't know if it, yeah. if participants can see the size. Can see yours. No, can see yours. This okay. looks this sure. looks great to me. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I've also um sorry. So my name is Daniel. <laughs> for for those of us who were already um in the workshop yesterday, yes, I think um, you already met me. But for the new participants. Yes, my name is Daniel. And um, today I'll be walking us through some coding in in Python. I would say I'm a student of Page because I started learning Python with Page. So <laughs> yeah, I'm one of her students. So um, we I think we can start. Before we log into the app and um, I open this um, Python intro notebook. And I'll just quickly walk us through it just so that we have um, some basis for the for both the in-person and then the online sessions that will be running come next week. Yes. So we will look at three main topics, if I can put it that way. So I'll briefly talk about the basics in Python, describe what objects are, and then we do one or two data manipulations. Yes, so, um, so coding basics. So, um, so Python is a really interesting language. So you, you can do, there's so much that you can do with Python, but as for those of us who are beginners, say, I would say that Python can, can be used as a calculator. So these are the cells. So I've already run this notebook. So as we go through, I'll run them and most probably things will not change. Hopefully there are no errors. <laughs> so I ran the first cell and um, yes. So the, the quick flash you, you saw was just the computation taking place that was really fast. So I was just doing a simple addition of one and five. And I do another one. I did try to divide 25 by 10, just to see if it's, it's, it's possible to do such a computation in Python. So it's possible as we can see. Yeah, so um, quickly, I want to talk about variables. So as we go through the, the sessions, whether you are in person or um, online, you will be making use of variables, yes, because you always, anytime you are, you want to do any kind of analysis, you always want to store your data in some 
kind of form, which is, is easy for you to remember or for easy for you to relate to. So you always store objects or you always store information in what you call variables. So to store information in a variable, you use the equal to sign. So that's what we used to assign objects to variables in Python. And I always recommend that you always use uh, meaningful names like whatever, for instance, if you load data, you should in the in the name when you, you describe um, the name of the variable, you should try and use a name that is is probably related to the data so that as you run, because at some point you might be running like long, long lines of code and you want to be able to quickly remember what you've done quickly remember what kind of data sets you are working with so it's important to use meaningful names when you're providing um, names for your variables yes and as you you write code so these are what i call objects that you'll be using so i talk about four objects here there are other objects but this i feel are the basics that any beginner in Python should, should be aware of. So we have strings, we have integers, we have floats, and we have um, logical arguments. So for the logical, you have true or false. And so the integers are whole numbers and then the floats, decimals. And you, you, you can make any character or a, 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 any word in Python as uh, a string by putting it in, um, Comments you can use, um, sorry, by putting it in quotations. You can use single quotation or double quotation. So either way, you still have, um, you, you can create a, a string like that. And the strings can be used with um, these operators. So in Python, if you want to make reference to an equal to sign, because we are using the equal to sign to assign variables, you use a double equal to sign. If you want to use equal to, if you want to say equal to in Python, you use the double equal to. And then you can use and you can use all. And the, the fourth, the fourth is how you write. It's not, it's not equal to in Python. So you have an equal to sign and then the exclamation. And then you can also write greater than or equal to less than. So you can always combine this um different operators when you write them. Um, statements in, in Python. And then I describe the second group or class of um, objects. So usually when you're storing information, it's coming in one of these this forms. So you could have, if you, your data is just one dimension, I mean, later in the notebook, you'll we'll see the different examples. So if it's just one dimensional, then it's, and it contains the same kind of information or the same kinds of objects. So if um, you have, um, you store the variable and the, the contents of the variable are say only strings, then you, you, you have a vector. And then if it's maybe strings and numbers, then it becomes a list. Um, if your data is um, in two dimensional, usually have a matrix and tabular data, then you have um, a data frame. So the matrix has the same kinds of um, objects. And a data frame, you can have different kinds of objects. But most often, I think we are mostly working with arrays and because if you're not using tabular data and you're using large data sets, especially for oceanographers, most data, I think, are in arrays and, and they are in three or more dimensions. Yeah. So quickly, I ran it through um, like samples of vectors and yeah, so here in 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 this cell, in this cell, the days is the name of the variable, and then the the contents. I'm assigning this information to the variable days. So I want to store information on, um, I mean, abbreviated forms of of the some days of the week: Saturday, Monday, Sunday, Wednesday, in a variable called days. So. I run this cell quickly. Yes. And so you, this is how you store an object or a data in, in a variable. And in Jupyter, I think when you, in Jupyter, when you 
you can just call objects by just typing the names, the name of the, the variable, sorry. You just call the variable by just typing the name, yeah. So I run the next cell, which... It's working on it. Uh, should I tell you to send it to my email? Yeah. Thank you, Rich. Yes. So next, I we have another variable V1, and I'm storing um, this um, list of numbers inside this variable V1. So I run this cell too. And I run the next cell. Like I said, uh, if we I'm are called, distracting. Thank you, Paige. Um, like I said, you can just call um, a variable by just typing out the name, only that um, Python is case sensitive. So if you notice from the previous cells, I stored the variable name was days. Days, I mean, beginning with the small letter, not the capital letter. So if I run this um, new cell, you see that it shows an error message. So the error says the name days is not defined. So Python is case sensitive, so you should always be aware of that. I think the more you program, this becomes more, it becomes easier. So as we saw earlier, um, we talked about list being one of the data types. So in a list, the main difference, like it's shown here, is it doesn't just contain one kind of um, object, it has different kinds of objects. So in this particular list, we are having strings and numbers put together. So I run that um, object two, and then the next we have um, arrays. Like I said, most um, large graphic data sets yeah. are stored That's in array form. Yes, thank you. Yeah, just a gentle reminder for us to be mindful of our microphones. Yeah. So this is how to um, create an array, but I'll say the the cell beneath this particular um, array stored in the variable m1 is much um, is much cleaner. So you you can manually create an array by typing out everything, and you could also create the array by using um, the library NumPy. So here we are importing our first library. Um, libraries help us kind of easily carry out computations or manipulations we want to run in Python. So here I import the library NumPy. And NumPy, the name is it's a bit long. So you can, so, I mean, you can, you can give, you can store it as any, with any letters, but here what I do is to import NumPy as NP. So anytime I want to use NumPy, I can make reference to it by calling NP. So here I try to create an array, but do it more in a much cleaner way using the NumPy library. So I run this tool. Yeah, in the same way, you could also create data frames. Um, so I think usually it's not only usually most people are working with tabular data and um yeah if you get a good hang of handling tabular data i think it, it helps if you want to analyze um data multi-dimensional data yes so here we import our second um library and this is pandas so i import pandas as pd and so anytime, once again, anytime I want to call pandas, I can just type out PD and then I can use, use pandas. So, so I create the first thing I do prior to creating a data frame is to create a list of lists. So lists inside a list. So I have the first list um, Tom, and I want to assign a certain number 18 to Tom. Nick, another number 25 and Chris, another number 10. And so based on this list, I create a data frame from this list. So I call the data frame, I assign an, a name or assign this 
new object I want to create, which is a data frame to the variable df. And I use the, I call the function data frame from pandas. And so I have pd dot data frame. And then I call out first, I call the object I want to, or the variable I want to use to create the data frame, which we, we already call data above. And I want to use this as column name. So when you create a data frame to provide it with um, columns, column names. Yeah, so I run this and then we have a data frame. So this is a simple data frame. And so the, the zero, one, and two is the row index, the row indices. Zero, one, two are the row indices. And then the name, age are the column names. Yeah, I think you see more of this in the next session when my colleague Oladipo comes in. I mean, you see more of this. Yeah, so next we want to see how to check um, variable type. So we've been talking about different variables. So if you, you have, um, say a list of variables, how do you check if um, you are working with numbers, floats, or characters? Because it, this is very important because you cannot you can perform computations on, on characters. So numbers or numerical values can be stored as characters, but if the, the class of the, the variable is not um, either a float or an integer, then you cannot perform computations on it. You cannot do additions. And, Subtractions and yeah, computation cannot do anything of that sort. So we we have this variable v1, and um, we are storing some if object inside that, and we are just storing like a single number ten. And so the response is int, which is is a short form for integer. So v1 is an integer. So we it already tells us that v1 um, is an integer. And then next, I have the decimal. 456.78 and I'm assigning it to the variable v2 and I try to check the, the class or the type of the variable. I run this so as so, so we mentioned earlier and I will just quickly go up just to remind us, so we already created an array and we we store this at eight. So we want to check the type and just be sure that it's really an array. And so I run this cell. And yeah, it, it, it shows that it's an NumPy array, yeah. And we also created a data frame. I tried to check the type to be sure that it's also a, a data frame, so. Yes, the response is um, that it's a data frame. It's a pandas data frame, yeah. Next, um, I want to quickly run through indexing or subsetting. So usually when you are working with um, data, you're most likely going to be do, doing this because um, sometimes you don't get data in the form in which you want it, or you, you have data that is too large, you just want to use a small chunk of it. So you need to index. And so in other languages, indexing some languages like R, I, 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 I can confirm in R. So in R, you start indexing from one, but then in Python, indexing starts from zero. And you can do the indexing using both positive numbers and negative numbers. And, and so I will we'll just run quickly through this. So if you want to, if you wanted to subset with the positive number, so here, just subset in zero. So once again, I quickly go up to mind So we had a list here, we created a certain list which had numbers and strings. So here I want to subset um, the, from that particular list, I want to subset um, the element in the, the first element, which is in the index position zero, and is that is the first element. So, the second element is um, index position. The second is in. I mean, if you look at your data, it's in the second position by its index position one. So here I run this cell also. Yes, 
uh, that two final one. And so it also gives a result. And we see from the list, we see from list one that um, the number 10 is in, is in the first position or is in index position zero. So that was the response we had. And now we try to see how negative indexing works. So negative, negative indexing starts from the, you start from negative one and it's the, the last element in the, in the object or the last element of the information you start. So yes, so the answer we have here is Wednesday. So I quickly go back to the list just to confirm. And we see from the list that Wednesday is, um, is in the last, um, is the last element in the object. So that's how can we see um, Wednesday, yes. And so this, this kind of indexing just kind of, they, they provide a foundation to do more complex kinds of indexing because Mostly you will not be doing um, simple indexing like this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you'll be doing, you'll be doing more um, expanded forms, yes. So also from the data frame. So here we, I call the, the data frame DF, which we created earlier. And then inside DF, I want to go into the column name. And inside this column name, I want to subset the first element. So, if you want to, so this is a way to index uh, an element in a specific column in a data frame. So I run this cell also. And we see in it, a quick glance at our data frame. And you see that um, Nick is, um, like I said, indexing doesn't start from zero, sorry. And so Nick is in, in index position one. And so that's why we have Nick here. Yeah, and I think um, probably the last set of um, items to introduce us to. So I want to also talk about conditional statements. So also when you're manipulating data, um, you sometimes want to do different things. Like you want to get some kind of information based on, on a, a predefined um, condition. So that's what um, if statements or that's what conditional statements allow you to do. So we have if we have if, if statements, we have else statements, you have elif. And so here we demonstrate quickly how to use the if statement. So say we have uh, some two variables x, y, and we write um, an if statement like this. If y greater than x, then you use your column and then you want to print a certain response. And when writing if statements is, is very important to indent the, the lines that follow the, if you want to perform a certain manipulation inside the, a particular conditional, you, you indent that particular function. Otherwise you have an error message. So that's why you see the indent here. So, it prints that y is greater than x. So it, it, it checked, first it checked, it checked whether this statement that we have here, whether it's true, whether indeed y is greater than um, x, and then it printed this because it met the condition. And so we also want to add another conditional where say if the first condition is not met, then what should the, the, the code do? So I'm still using the same um, variables x and y, and we write um, this next statement where we say that if x equals equals y, I mean that's how usually I will literally read it. But this is just if x equals y. Uh, but because we are using um, equal to as um, we used to assign variables, like I mentioned earlier, you use the double equal to sign. So what we're asking the code to do here is to check if x equals equals y. And if indeed x is equal y, it should print x equal to y. But what about the case where if x is not equal to y? So what should the code do? So if x is not equal to y, should, so we use the elif 
So it's like a combination of else and if. So they live. So if if this first condition is not met, the code should print x is less than y. So I run this cell two, and we see x is less than y because when comparing the two variables, you can it's it's visible that x is not greater than y. So you have this, and then the last. Um, Conditional, I want to introduce us to is else. So, what else does is to consider anything that is not um, caught by the in initial conditions that you set? So, a quick demonstration is here. And so, if we hear what we are doing is to check first if um, x is greater than y, if x is greater than y, we want to print x is greater than y. And if this is not a case, we we apply an elif condition where we say, okay, if this is not a case, check whether x is equal to y and x is equal to y, then print x and y are equal. But how about if these two conditions are not met, if the if and elif conditions are not met, what should the code do? Then the code should print x is less than y. So I run this cell too. So when you're manipulating data, you can use a, a combination of, of different conditions, depending on what you are interested in, depending on what kind of information you want to work on. Exactly, yeah. And lastly, I give a brief intro to using a for loop. So, yeah, like the name suggests, it's a, it's a loop. So you kind of iterate through um, some objects or some um, data to obtain some information from there. So I create this um, this variable. It's a list of um, numbers. And we try to, let me run this cell, and then I explain. So. The variable is v3, and we are just using i to represent the different elements in v3. So we, what I called, of what we've written, the meaning of this is, is that for, we want to check that for every element in v3, is this element equal to the element in index position 2? Which is 30. So 30 is in index position two. So that is what the code is doing. So for i in v3, print i. If that particular i is exactly equal to the element in position three by index two. Yes. So I run this and it, it gives us um, some logical responses. So we have false, false, true, false, false. So this for loop, it, it went over, it took each and every element and tried to see whether this satisfies the condition that had been provided. And from this logical responses, we only see that it's only the element 30 that satisfy the condition. And that's how come it's only the element having true. Yes, and I ran the last um, example of using a for loop. And so I here I create um, a certain variable called spots and I just store um, a string of spots names inside this variable. And so we have um, similar to, 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 to the code above. So we have here I use X instead of I to represent the different elements in the variable. So for x inside spots, check if that particular x is equal to baseball, or as we literally read it, if x is equal, equal baseball. And then if this is true, then you print, then the push prints um, baseball. So I run this, and yes, it prints baseball. <laughs> yeah, so um, that kind of come, that kind of concludes this quick 
intro um, to and uh, basics some basics in in python and i would end by saying that um so when it or i personally i mean if it comes when it comes to programming i think google it's your best friend and what i do is or what is helpful is that to just think about what you want to do and then you translate it into words add python to whatever you've written in your search bar and search for what you want to do usually it will give you you have a, a some responses on google or whichever search engine you are using and most often there's um, a huge community on stack overflow so when you see when you when different links pop up yeah you could just or usually i'm selecting the one that has stack overflow um if i see something linked to stack overflow because um that particular site is helpful yes and so that concludes this um introduction yeah thank you very much for your attention yes so um i'll hand over to Paige. i don't know whether we take questions now Hello, Paige. yes uh yes. thanks daniel that was great um yeah looks like we have a few questions okay we take um, questions now okay yeah why don't you go ahead and take questions um roland okay um good evening everyone or good morning wherever you are just a little um comment on the if and for lucidness i think um, most of the participants some of them are like um, beginner in python so like um using the loop and this it may like after like you pass the loop or this it may the next line should be indented meaning like the argument hello hope you can hear me yes please. yes we can okay. hear you so i uh, like just a comment like what i was uh, like um the next statement should be indented for example for this for i in v3 so the next line should be indented so that we will be able to like um the loop statement or this statement be able to be that kind of like a definition so that was my comment thank you daniel for the wonderful work thank you too for the comment thank you okay so i think the next person whose hands i can see is olu jumuke so you can yes uh, um thank you daniel um sure uh, well uh, i'm a newbie in python and uh, i'm thinking like they said yesterday that we'll get a recording of first year's workshop well i don't know about others but i didn't get any recording so i'm thinking would, well i mean would we, are, we, are we going to have access to this one so that you be you know, like a guide so because yes. um yes. I, I, and if it is possible for you to go back that is if it is possible you can go through it again it will really help okay so um yeah. about the the video or the recording for yesterday um if, if you join the slack channel then the video the link to the video is there the video has been uploaded to the slack channel you can also visit the so question has a youtube channel and if you you visit the youtube channel then you should see the recording there too so the recording the link was not sent to like to individual emails it's been i think it's been uploaded I, I, if i'm right and i checked i, checked correct slack. Me. I went through yeah, the slack i, I have this slack there, I, it's, I yep, didn't see so it. all all recordings um, I'm trying to limit the number of emails I send so things don't get lost. So I'm going to send one email with the recording from yesterday and today uh, in a few hours. Yesterday's recording is up on the YouTube. Someone, I think, just linked to it. It's also linked in the Python 2022 Slack channel. So I encourage you all to go and join that because that's where we will be posting all of these resources. So everything will be recorded and shared in those places. 
Yes, J just to add to that, I think, um, so it, it, it's not, I mean, I won't have a problem going through it, but we have um, a number of activities we want to go through today. So um, I will say that um, we finished and maybe you rewatch the video again. If you have questions, the Slack channel too, you can always post questions over there. And I mean, if there's anything that we are always ready to help. Yes, so um, about going over, unless Paige has, wants me to do it, but I would think that we want to- No, I think, yeah, go. we only have half an hour left and we have um, Oladipa Mumin, uh, who will be giving more content. So I encourage you to watch the recording and you can pause when you need to and go back through it. Um, Daniel and I will also be offering virtual Python sessions where you can stop and ask questions uh, throughout. So hopefully that is okay with everyone. Great, thanks. I think there are no more questions. Is that it? Any more questions? Daniel. Yes. Don't forget to drop it in the please. I'm waiting for it in the comment section. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, I didn't. I said you should not forget to um send us your email in the comment section. It's like the class is running up already. Okay. Page, please, did you get that? I, I didn't get what. Yes, I think request. they want you to add your email to the chat. No, email, your email, your email. Ah, okay, 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 that's fine. Email. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, okay. Oladipo, I'll are stop you, sharing now. Would you like to take the floor? Okay, good day, Page. Good day, all. Um, I'm trying to share right now. Let me know if you can. Uh, Paige, can you please confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, I can see it and it looks great. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Okay, good day, all. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so, my question. Hola, Deepo, your, your audio is not coming through very well. We're getting some background noise. Okay, is it, is it better now? Um, we still get a bit of the background noise. If you speak up, that will help. Okay, and you, is it clear? Is it better? Uh, maybe. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yes. This sounds good, yes. Okay, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so my name is Oladipo. Um, I learned uh, Python for the first time in Koising, I think uh, 2018, and um, my instructor was uh, Paige. Thanks a lot. That's, uh, uh, learning Python has greatly improved my career path and also assisted my research. So let me go straight to the point and uh, the things I'll be covering today. Uh, I wish and I, and I hope uh, that everybody will also be, uh, especially for the beginners, we also be able to learn a lot of things from here and be able to forge ahead in their career path. A lot of things can be done with Python and it can be used to automate uh, a lot of repetitive work that we do doing our data analysis. And of course we can extend it to some other things, which we, if time permits, I may just uh, mention. Now the learning objective for uh, this section, number one is uh, to be able to import libraries. Of course, um, Daniel has, been, uh, has um, highlighted that, but uh, so I will just go through it. And um, after then we'll load uh, data. .csv data, we'll load it. 
then uh, we'll be able to manipulate the data and see some of the features of the data. Then uh, we also look at uh, how to manipulate rows and columns in the, uh, in the data array. Then also we we'll plot um, some sample graphs from the data that we have um, uploaded. Uh, and then uh, we define, we we'll learn how to define functions. Of course, while learning to define functions, uh, we will be able to also learn some basic uh, Python functions, while loops, uh, etc. So let's get on to it. So uh, the first uh, I have here, let's write our first code. I'm sure Daniel has done um, justice today, so I uh, will just skip that part. So to make it very fast, uh, it is not uh, what, number one, while important libraries, I need um, about three libraries for what I, for all of the things that I've put together here. But of course we have so many libraries. So for each of your projects that you want to do, you may need um, um, some more additional libraries apart from this, and you may even, on, uh, apart from all of this, but these are kind of the basic libraries that you need for data, analysis when you are dealing with Python, when you are using Python for that data analysis. Of course, additional data, additional libraries can be used um, perhaps when you are dealing with most, uh, additional, uh, when you additional tax for your data analysis. So now I have three libraries. I have the pandas, which uh, undo the, which undo tables and uh, time series. Uh, I, I, I'm also importing a uh, match, match plot library, which undo some plots. It's able to, this library helps us to be able to plot our uh, data um, in two dimensions. Uh, also, we have the NumPy, uh, the NumPy which, I have, um, which I'm importing as NP. We have, this is for handling arrays, uh, which, are, which can be multidimensional. Of course, um, I know, uh, Daniel had, had uh, intel us on this. So now let me just start. Now we can run each of the cell by clicking this, but uh, we can also run it by entering, by clicking control and enter, which of our one is uh, more convenient for us. So now let's go on to load um, CSV files. Now, the data that I want to load, that, that I, I have a sample data here, which I've installed right in the same directory as uh, the Python. Of course, if you're, if you're using um, uh, Jupyter on the local drive, it means that um, if, you want to, uh, if you want to load the data, you, must, you need to either save it right in the um, domain where, I mean, the, the, right in the location where you have installed the Python, the Jupyter notebook, or, you specify the uh, you, you you give it what is it complete space uh, you specify completely the path of that um, file. So I have I I want to uh, assess uh, the metrological data which I have saved there and um, load it onto Python onto onto the the notebook. So I have it here inside the folder. And this is the name of the file. And the type of the extension of the file is the CSV. I'm asking it to just um, ignore the headers and uh, also this, the separator is comma. So it helps you be able to divide uh, the, the uh, whatever data it is loading with the separator is uh, indexed as a comma. Now, <clears throat> this line helps us to convert the data that we are loading into data frame. If it, has not, uh, if it is not in the data frame, so that we can be able to completely make use of all of the uh, the, the Panda um, libraries to be able to manipulate it. And now we, we uh, the print is uh, print data. We, this instruction is to help us uh, print and have a visual of the data that we have just loaded. So I will just click on that and we'll see the data. So we can see the data we have um, Time stamp, the atmospheric pressure, lightning, etc. So now, for the purpose of this uh, of this class, I want to focus on on solar radiation. So, so, 
I just want to focus on the, the solar radiation and temperature. So now, so henceforth, that is what we'll be looking, that's what we'll be uh, channeling, channeling towards. Now, the next line here, I haven't called, uh, the reason I added this is I deliberately added that we will see what happens if we, are on, if we didn't specify the path of the data properly. Now you can see that here, I didn't specify, I only uh, gave the name of the data. Now let's try and run it and see if that will uh, load. Oops, it doesn't because we have not specified the path of the data correctly. So except we are able to put, uh, to specify it by, that by putting the, uh, the solar radiation, which is the folder that's containing the data. Like I've done now, we would be having that we had previously. So let me cancel. So I would like, um, I'll be happy if, as I'm going, as uh, what I'm doing, if uh, people can also go along with me so that if, so that if there's an error from your side, you'll be able to know. And if, by the time I'm done, you'll be able to have questions that are directly, uh, that can directly help you learn. Now, here we have uh, we have data aid. This is uh, now if you look at this data that we load. We see that we have about six hundred and seven uh, six thousand seven hundred and thirty four rows and, and twelve columns. That's a lot of data, and of course, this is smaller to the amount of data we dealing with in real life application. Maybe. Uh, We'll be dealing with data that uh, that have maybe thousands of, I mean, tens of thousands of rows and uh, uh, maybe hundreds of columns. Now, we may want to because we don't uh, it, because Python provides us with uh, ability not to be able to uh, since we cannot just scroll through all of the data, but we would, maybe we are just doing our data analysis and we just want to have an overview of how the data looks like. Um, uh, we can use the head. We can use data head to be able to see the uh, part of the data just the beginning. And here I've specified the first twenty-four. Uh, I want to see. I want to know how it looks like. So I to be able to know how to deal with the, with those data. Now here are the first of uh, and I'm saying that uh, it starts from what then? And uh, now we'll Depot, can you can you speak up a bit more? It's getting hard to hear you again. Um, here we start from you can see the data starts from our 10 on the 26th uh, March. And uh, one thing that we'll notice from here, we have the next one is the index, um, the index one is our 11 to our 12. So you can have a perspective that, okay, this is an hourly data. Now, well, uh, it lasts. So this can give you a general overview of what the data looks like. Uh, and, uh, the ability to be able to know what to do and how to deal with the data. So that is what uh, that does. And again, you can use uh, describe uh, to be able to know, to have also uh, a kind of uh, general overview, kind of statistical uh, of the data. So let's get that. We, we see here that we have a number of, uh, of individual elements in that uh, data. That means we have about 5,264 uh, uh, points that, that had value. Of course, you will notice that up here, we have 6,704 rows. However, by the time you have used the disk, we use the disk, right? We are just for atmospheric pressure. That shows that. There are certain there are certain uh, rows that does not have data, and we only have we have five thousand plus rows that have data for the atmospheric pressure column. 
And again, in the standard deviation, the minimum value that you have, the 25 or 20 percentile, the 50, uh, 50 percentile, 75 percentile, the maximum value. And that, that is consistent for all of the um, columns. It can give you a, what's it called, uh, a brief summary, of, um, a statistical description of that particular data. And also, we can use uh, data to shape to know how it is. Of course, we have data two dimension and one dimension. So, uh, when we do with uh, one dimensional data, is different from the way it does with, with the two dimensional data, the way it does with uh, this data, dimensional data by those of um, uh, well, Adipo, it's still very difficult to hear you. I don't know if others are having the same problem. Um, uh, I don't, when you speak louder, we can hear you over the noise, but as, as you go, it gets quieter and then we can't hear you. Okay, I don't know if you're um, using headphones or if you could try a different audio source. Okay, maybe I would just try a different. Is it better now? It's about the same. Okay, maybe I should print a uh, audio source. There's an interference somewhere. Maybe there are two electronic devices close to you. There are more than one, something like that. Okay, something like an interference? Yes, there's an interference in the background. Uh, let me do it. Is it better now? Kind of the same. We, it's the same, yeah. Which it's it's okay if you speak very loudly, but we hear the noise the whole time. So you just have to be very loud the whole time. Otherwise, we can't hear you over the interference. Oh, oh okay. Sorry to disrupt your. No, no okay. Um, is it better? I will oh, just find. Wait, something. this is. Oh no, it was great for for a second. Now I still hear the interference. It was great for a second. Yeah. Okay, now there, there is interference now. I don't hear it. No, nope. I hear it a little bit. Yeah, I do still hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't want I don't want to take too much time. Um, just um, maybe continue, but but just speak very loudly so we can hear you over over the interference. Um, Kwame, did you have a suggestion? You have your hand raised, or did you yeah, have a no, question? Um, I had wanted to look at the the pathway for the data set it was it was preparing. Sorry, could you ask the question again? I wanted him to scroll up so that I could see the data, the pathway for the data where he called the, into the PD, the data sets. I think the name he used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to see it because uh, I think on the hub you shared, inside the solar radiation, we have two tables. Mm -hmm. so I wanted to know which of them was plotting. I see. You should be able to, if you're on the hub, you can click on the um, the notebook he's going through and you can follow along and you can see what's written there. Yeah, it throws an error when you run the table. Oh, okay. Yeah, initially it was solar radiation, but it's, it's a folder instead of a table. In the new link you said. Okay. Page. Yes. Am I audible enough now? It, we still hear the interference, but again, if you speak loudly, I think we, we can make it. Is that okay? okay. Sorry for okay. the interruption. So Kwame just wanted you to scroll up to where you uh, load the data. If you don't mind. Uh, yeah, look, uh, okay, let me just scroll up to it. Now, uh, please, you, you may need to edit the code. For the reason I was uh, insisting, that I was advising, I mean, that uh, you should follow. 
uh, that I'm talking about, the reason I was taking my time to explain it. Now, you need, you need to be able to specify the, uh, the path as I have done here. The path that I specified, solar radiation slash um, TA0071 underscore 2020 to CSV. Are you with me? Yes, I think that was it. Yeah, Thank I'm you. Good. Thank you. You can continue okay. now. Hello, yeah. are you able to hear me now? Uh, yes, please go ahead and continue where you left off. Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, let us plot, let us uh, have our first plot. So it's when you need to plot a data, you can just use a plot uh, plt dot plot data. Then here I am specifying since we have so many rows about any colon about 12 columns and um, i only want to the data for a particular column so i can index that particular column using the uh, uh, the column name of course if i first um daniel was able to show us how to be able to index um rows and columns in the previous so now we are putting it into use so indexing the, um, i'm trying to plot the data of um, radiation indexing. Uh, Hello? Yeah, indexing the column. I'm index. I'm calling it using the index name, and that is what I have done here. So you can just do that, and you are you you be getting a, a data point like this. And this is not the beautiful. We can make it. It's not beautiful and not uh, that um, descriptive. So we can make it um, by adding uh, I mean, the X, of course, we know the, the, the one, is, uh, the, the radiation that we have plotted, but what is on the X axis, we don't know. So to do that, I, we can add the timestamp now. Now, if to run this, most likely we will get stopped because uh, it will take so much time to be able to load it. And again, it will be so, cum it will be so uh, cumbersome when it's, but let us see how, how it comes out. A lot of, uh, by the time it uh, pop, pops up, you will see it's so uh, clumsy. So to be able to make data, what I then do is, uh, We'll come back later to it, but we want to get just few of the data. And to get those few data, I will be I um, I lock to select rows and to select a few columns and rows also. Now I allow us to be able to manipulate rows and columns. Calling by, uh, by specify, we can use uh, it to call. I mean to uh, to be able to retrieve certain number of columns from a data set or from an array or certain um, or certain numbers of certain number of uh, rows also from an array. So now let's do that. Yeah. So here I, I'm interested in selecting the first 38 um, rows for all of the data. So all of the columns. So I want to select okay now first the data we plotted is here now. I think my network is gone. Yeah, we lost your you we lost your screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, now we can. Okay. Now, everyone can see now that. This was the plot that we initially uh, uh, we initially had, and we had we tried to add, add the, the timestamp from uh, 
from the data. And you can see because it's a, it's a large data, it's kind of messy and we cannot see anything other than just uh, two lines. But all of, there are so much data embedded in here. So to make it uh, neater and be able to put it into perspective, let us just select 38 rows. That is from index zero to 38. And uh, for all the columns, so now let's, um, do, let us do this. Okay, good. So now we can see is in the zero to 37. So now let, let us, um, And having done that, we can, yeah, what we want to do is, I want to drop, um, I, I want to show you how we can be able to, just take, for example, you have so many rows and you just need few, you, you need, uh, you, you discover maybe perhaps from all of the data sets, you have maybe one or two columns that you don't want. Or you can also use it for rules, but here we just use it for columns just for demonstration sake. So there is uh, this function that we can use dot um, drop. So you can use that. You can use it to drop, um, to delete or remove uh, starting columns or rows from the data set that you have so that you can reduce it automatically without actually going back uh, to Excel and trying to do the mess. So let's try and see what, what we mean here. Oh, yeah. So now I've loaded it. Initially, you know, we, what we're dealing with was data. Now the new file that we are dealing with is uh, text data. So now let's see it. Let's see it first. We can see we have it all for. Let me switch to a more stable data. Can you? Can you? Ask, my, my screen is gone again, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> okay, it's back. Okay. We can see that we have uh, all of the all the all the, all the all the all the columns and the rows and up to all the columns here, both thirty six uh, rows. Now I want to remove just atmospheric uh, pressure and lightning from the date from the data so now just to demonstrate how the, the dropper um, works so from the test data let's run this and see the resulting now we can see that from here now atmospheric pressure used to be the first column right but now we've dropped it and uh, Sorry for that. And it's not it is no longer in the data in the data set. So and that is how you can be able to manipulate and also and drop some column if you have the data set, you don't need certain column, you just want to narrow it down. Then there is also there, there is also a way to also there are better ways of doing this also. Actually, you can instead of just dropping the ones you want, maybe you have uh, if there are too many you want to drop. Of course, it may be stressful to just um, start doing this. You can literally just select the ones you want using uh, uh, the, the, just selecting the ones you want. Of course, I will do that in the next uh, uh, shortly. Now, I haven't done that. Now, I want let's now focus on plotting our data. Now, we've already narrowed down our data to about um, 37 rows, and it will be neat now to, to plot. So this, the first line here is uh, plotting the data and adding the, the, the timestamp. And the second line is uh, rotating it. So now let me just, let me uh, first uh, comment this so that you will see how this, how it comes out. Now, here is the data plot with our timestamp. And we can see the X axis, even though the, the data is smaller, the X axis still looks, uh, uh, very clumsy. Now you can then rotate those. Uh, you can you can rotate the values of the x axis 
maybe to 90 degrees, 60 degrees using the rotation. You can rotate it to 90 degrees, 60 degrees, or whatever degrees you want, depending on how you want your craft to look like. And uh, let's do that and see how it comes out. Now we see that we can clearly see each of these, uh, each, we can clearly see each of the values now on the X axis. And this the graph looks neater now. But however, we don't have, uh, currently we don't have uh, the labels on the, of the X axis, the, the, I mean the Y axis, then the X axis or the title. So we can hide that quickly. So what we want to spec here, we want to specify the X axis, the Y axis. However, we can also, here yeah, what, what we are trying to do, what I'm trying to do here is uh, to make the, uh, the plot even look uh, more pleasing and more tidy to look at, at. Now to do that, instead of just having it the way we had it here, and we had all of this, which is not looking cool, we can simply just have the axis at interval, you know, so that it looks more presentable. Now, how do we do that? Now to do that, since I have just about 24 sets of data, I can divide it into, uh, into six using a NumPy arrange. So I have 24, I divide it into six, and uh, that means I'm only expecting four data sets. And from four those four data sets, those are the points where you just put, uh, you just put uh, the X axis label. And let's run it and see. Of course, it looks neater now. Now, however, there's something I have done here. Let me uh, uncomment this. Yeah. Okay. Now, let me come. Let me just comment this first. Uh -oh. There's something I did here. I will try. I will first try and delete this label. Let's run this. I want you to see the difference now. Now. I have not had it. What happened here is you can see that it was the original values that are in the data set that is being uh, that, is, uh, that is being displayed currently, right? However, if you want to specify what should be on the what should be uh, displayed on those ticks, you can then specify. I, I you can specify it using. You can specify it just like this. You know, you can, you can write anything here, just like anything you want to display around there. So, and that is it. So, uh, of course, this is just to give you a, a general idea of how to plot a graph. We'll be plotting a, a more standard graph during the uh, uh, during the the uh, the work the summer school. So this is to give a then general review. So it's not going, this is the most of those, the values here does not really, I mean, uh, specify or uh, mean anything in the physical world. So it's just to have, give everybody a general overview. Now we want to be able to add the title, the title of uh, the graph, the label, the X label, use the X label, just specify whatever you want to be written as the, the, as the Y, I mean the Y label, what we want to be written as um, on the, uh, the label of the Y axis, and also the X label, whatever, whatever you want to write as the label of the X axis. And um, let's run that and see. And this looks uh, a lot neater, like um, uh, the graph you will be need, you will be willing to um, add to any of uh, our research work. Now, quickly. Because of my time, I think I've spent uh, more than 20, uh, 30 minutes. Yeah. So quickly, uh, defining function, I will just um, run through it quickly. Now, our data, the data that I've been given that we load, we loaded is in Hawa. However, there are some times in for do for us who are in the physical, uh, in, who are researching in the. Uh, in maybe physical oceanography or something or something like that, we may sometimes we are giving data in we take data uh, in seconds and we need to convert those data to hours to be able to compare. Perhaps maybe you have two parameters you are trying to compare, 
and one was you downloaded it in house and the other in seconds and you want you may you may of course need to convert those in seconds to hour or maybe you download it a certain data in day, as a daily average and you have another data as uh, maybe um in hour, then you may need to convert those hourly average to daily average so that you'll be able to make a comparison. Now, here is a function to be able to do that. And of course, I provide this function so that you can we can also know how function works. Yeah, yeah. so. Now, I will just um, load our data again. Now, here, yeah, what I've just done is, I have from if you go back to the, the data that we loaded, we will see that the first, um, 13 um, rows are actually from hour 10 to hour 23. So if we are trying to convert hourly to daily data, we know that we have 24 hours in a day. So it is um, for us to be able to automate it, it's better we discard off the first 13 rows so that we know that we are starting afresh from hour zero to hour 24, to hour 24 as it uh, uh, proceed like that. So, and that is the essence of using this line. Of code. Now I've specified. I've, uh, I'll be loading the data inside a data hood as the new uh, file that we'll be working with. So now let me quickly do to run that. Oh, oops. Sorry, I changed that. So I think we we are working with data. Now. So and that is what we have done now. So after doing that, here is a um, uh, function that I have. Uh, I saw it somewhere. Then I, I modify it to be able to convert uh, our uh, hourly data to uh, to daily data. So we have, in the, let me quickly go on through this. We create, this is combined, we are creating an empty list. Then uh, the length of, um, to get the length of, now what it is doing is it will get the length of the entire uh, data. Then I is just to be used as counter, then combine.append, append is, it, uh, it, it's a uh, it, it function. Very, it's it's a, it's a function that can be used to actually write into a data. Uh, a, uh, I mean, a data frame, something like that. So now I have since I I um, what I would what I would do here. I would just select just three. Okay, I think. Yeah, so what I would do here before before running the code, uh, the app here, what we are, which is, I have written it mainly to work with um, three columns. Now, column one, we uh, index column, which will be, we will write exactly what is in that column. Then we have the, uh, the second column, it will just take the mean of that. Uh, of that column. Now, this mean is also is a function. Mean element is a function that has been defined. Now, here is the, 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 the mean element function. Now, what does it do? It, will, it simply takes the mean of the data. It takes three inputs. The, uh, the st I mean, four inputs, three inputs from the data frame that we, are, we will be dealing with. Number one, the start. It's, it, that will specify where you want uh, the, the, the function to start uh, taking the mean from, and the end. That means to specify the range of the data that you want to take uh, the mean. Then the column to, you specify the column that you want uh, that to be applied to. And um, how the defined function works now is, whenever we call this function, we have to specify four uh, elements. Number one, you have to we have to specify the data frame we want to work with. Number two, we have to, we have to specify the start, the end, and the column. Now, we are calling the main element here to be appended and written inside the first column, index one column. Now, this will also take the main of the index two column. So we. Uh, uh, Whatever is in index one, index zero will be in index zero. Index one will take the mean of um, the four data, which we which will be equals to one day. That's the daily mean. Then the, the index two, the mean of twenty four data, 
if you count one to zero to 23, that's 24, then take the mean and that's equals to 24, then it will append it all inside the empty, uh, the empty data frame we have created combined. And after that, everything will then be uh, taken back. Everything will then, after everything is stored in combined, everything will be uh, will be loaded into whatever we have specified it. Now let's test that and just see how that works. Now, before we test that, I remember I said we can only, we have only uh, written that to work with the three columns, so I can quickly specify those three columns. Here. Oladipo, are you still there? Hmm. Looks like we may have lost you. Okay. <laughs> I think maybe there was some more internet trouble. Oladipo, are you are you back? No, nope, I think we might have completely lost him. Okay. Maybe we'll give him a minute or two to get back. In the meantime, are there any questions uh, that anyone would like to ask about what's been covered? I think we've been helping people in the chat get access to the hub. So hopefully everyone has been successful with that. Okay, no questions. Well, it is a little bit over time. We will see if Oladipo is able to reconnect. Daniel, did you have anything you wanted to say? No, 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 no. I would just encourage participants to join the Slack channel. I mean, especially the Python channel, yes, yeah, so that you can report any issues you might have, whether it's with the hub or with the coding itself. Yeah, anything at all, you can report it there. Yes, yeah. and uh, sim similarly, please include details about the help that you need. If you just say, I can't log in, we can't help you because we don't know why. So please um, add screenshots or copy and paste error messages. And then we can we can help interpret what's going wrong and, and get you all set up. And for those of you in the virtual school, we will be sending out a schedule, a full schedule later this week. Um, before, probably this weekend before um, before for next week. And Daniel and I will be running the, the Python sessions there. Okay, well, I don't know if Oladipo is going to make it back to us. Maybe his internet went out. Um, okay, there's a question of how to join the Slack channel. I think I'm, I will post, um, you all should have gotten an email from Brian Arbick that had a link to join the Slack channel. Um, I can see if I can find that. Um, once you are in the Slack workspace, if you click the little plus near the channels, 
it, it, there are two options. You can click browse channels and you can find Python 2022. Um, the other thing I will do is I will, um, I encourage you all to introduce yourselves in the introductions channel. I'll introduce myself and I'll link to the Python channel. And then all you have to do is click on that and, and say join channel. Hola Dipo, you're back. Um, yes, I'm back, sorry. Uh, I think my network, my, I, had an, I had a glitch. That's no problem. It happens to all of us. Um, thanks, Daniel. So Daniel just put the invitation to join the Slack workspace in the chat. Oladipo, did you want to continue? Or should um, we? Do I, do I have to, if I still have time, I can continue. Otherwise, we can, I can just uh, present this maybe during the cover the course of um, the workshop. I think that sounds good. We've been going now for over an hour, almost two hours. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I, you can do the rest and f finish up during the in-person workshop. Okay, that would be great, no problem. And for those who are not um, available or not at the in-person school, uh, the, the notebook that uh, Oladipo was using is still available and you can still walk through it yourself. If you have any questions, Oladipo will mostly be available for in-person, but you can ask questions in the Slack channel. Daniel and I can try to answer them. Uh, we'll try and make sure Oladipo is also on the, on the Slack channel so you can ask any questions uh, or so he, that he can answer any of your questions. <laughs> 